Good evening. Welcome to the General Society. Um, I am Karen Taylor. I am Program Director of the Society, and it is our pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Tonight's lecture is um, a labor lecture, which is part of the Labor, Literature, and Landmark Lecture Series. Our lectures are supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. We're pleased to present this lecture with the New York Landmarks Conservancy and the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art and thank both organizations for their promotional assistance of this event. For those of you who may be less familiar with the General Society, a brief introduction. Uh, the Society was founded in 1785, and in fact this year we are celebrating 230 years. We were founded by the School Craftsmen of New York City. Today we, uh, uh, we continue to serve and improve the quality of life of the people of the City of New York through our educational and cultural programs. These include uh, our General Society Library, of course, of which you're in this evening, uh, this uh, lecture series, we have a nearly 200-year-old lecture series, uh, and our tuition-free school, the Mechanics Institute. And finally, for those of you who may be interested, and in particularly those of you who are your first visit, we have a wonderful lock museum upstairs. Um, you will find uh, a postcard that gives you more information on the society on your seat, and if you're interested in pursuing library membership, you will find information on that on the front of the room. This season's Labour Lectures explores different aspects of the urban, urban infrastructure and urban environment of the city, and tonight's topic, the works and autonomy of the city, perfectly encapsulates both themes. Based on her work, the works, the autonomy of a city, and using New York City as her point of reference, Kate Asher this evening will explain how things work in the modern city. She will discuss the innovative technologies that power the met metropolis and the physical infrastructure that keeps the city working. Kate Asher is a partner in Bureau Happold Engineering and leads Bureau Happold Cities Groups, which specializes in urban planning and development. She is currently the Milstein Professor of Urban Development at Columbia University, where she teaches real estate, infrastructure, and urban planning courses. She's also the author of several books on public infrastructure and the delivery of municipal services. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Kate Asher to you. Um, well, I'm very honored to be here. I've actually never been in this hall before, and it's very imposing. I'm feeling very small. I'm feeling like I want to run away and look at the Locke Museum, actually, but I think I'll have to leave that for another day. So um, some of you may know this book already. This is not a new book, and so I was um, kind of tickled when I was invited to speak. This is a book that came out about 10 years ago. Um, I've since done two other graphic books that um, explain different parts, one on skyscrapers, one on transportation. This is by far my favorite because it covered so many aspects of the city. Um, what you'll see actually, this is the way with infrastructure, hasn't really changed much in the 10 years. Normally you have to update books and you know make them more current. There's one or two things I'll point to that have changed, but by and large, not much has changed, probably in about 100 years, but certainly in the 10 years since I've done this. So I'm gonna just take you on a little journey and it's meant to be, meant to be kind of fun, um, so hopefully it won't get too boring along the way. Um, so this is actually the original presentation I did when we first came out with the book, and it's meant to take you on a journey of, through a variety of um, aspects of infrastructure. So we'll start with New York, obviously, and you know, if you're an infrastructure follow you and follower and in, in this place, many of you may be, you kind of know that there's all sorts of hidden infrastructure that are part of your life. Um, what we're trying to do here tonight is basically just take you through a whole series of components. This is not comprehensive. The book covers a lot of things that aren't in this lecture, but I wanted to just cover some random pieces that I thought might be interesting and might relate to, you know, infrastructure you would use in an evening out 
in the city. So um, the, the one thing you will note is the first one is probably the most antiquated because 10 years ago, we weren't all doing stuff by email. We we're actually sending paper invitations to people, but now we're not anymore. So anyway, okay. So let's move forward and we will start with that very antiquated idea of the mail and an invitation. Um, and again, I'm picking out fun things from back then and now. Um, one of the most fun things that I came across in looking at infrastructure was the old pneumatic tube mail network that actually handled an awful lot of the mail in New York City from about the turn of the century. Um, the system is shown in the little green dots that are making their way around there. Let's see if I can get this red dot here. Um, so it really just covered Manhattan and a little bit of Brooklyn. And this on the, on the right, and again, this is all in the book, so you can be able to look at it if you want to, is the canister that actually carried the letters through this pneumatic tube system. And so there was about 27 miles of tube that actually piping that went around Manhattan with 23 different stations. And the idea of it was that this would carry the mail from the general post office, which is around Penn Station, to post offices at Grand Central, up the east side, up the west side to 23 different locations. So it actually carried a lot of mail. At one point, I think it was yeah 95,000 letters per day. Um, it operated for about 20 years. Then they decided it was, you know, too creaky and it wouldn't operate anymore. But then in true New York fashion, the contractors who were involved either sued the city or lobbied the city, and it was put back into service in 1922 and operated in some vestigial capacity until, if you can believe it, 1953. So, you know, the automobile came and people decided we don't need pneumatic tubes, we can use little postal trucks in 1917, but somehow it stayed in operation until 1953. So, the, you know, the letters went went fast through the system, they went about 30 miles an hour, which, you know, is kind of impressive for a pneumatic system. Anyway, um, onto, the, onto the modern day. So here's what happens today. And again, this seems, seems a little antiquated compared to the internet, but here's what happens with the mail today. And obviously we know that mail gets put in a mailbox, it gets carried a little truck to a big truck, and it goes to a sorting facility. Um, what we don't know is that there's a fair amount of automation, or you know, has been for the last decade in the post office, that actually enables um, machines to scan and separate the mail that comes in and they separate it into some that's barcoded, some that's typed, some that's handwritten. And that mail then goes through a series of machines and in theory you should be able, the machines are able to read the addresses. And when they are able to read the addresses, they look at them, they assign um, those that don't have a barcode a barcode based on what they read. Um, and then they move from there. There are always letters or packages that are hard for the machine to read. And so what's super interesting is they actually take those and they scan them, a sort of some kind of remote scanner. And the remote scanner tries to match the visual image with a series of images on file. If it can't do that, that video image is sent to a remote facility. I don't know if it's still operated, but originally, um, 10 years ago when I wrote the book, it, it, it was in Fishkill, New York. So it was up the Hudson. Somebody sitting in Fishkill would look at this image and then type in the right you know, barcode or zip code, and then it would get the barcode and it would be sent back along into the system. And so those labeled packages are then sent to a sorting facility by their barcode. They're sent on in these trucks to the local post office where they then go through another automated sorting by the postal carrier's route. So they're separated into the various routes and then they're delivered to their end user. Okay. So using the elevator, this is not actually appropriate for tonight because we didn't use an elevator. We just walked down a few steps, but um, elevators are very much a part of modern life and certainly modern tall buildings in New York. So um, some of you may know that electricity was more or less invented here. Thomas Edison's first um, experiment with commercial electricity happened in... Uh, Pearl Street, downtown Manhattan in 1882. It was the Edison Illuminating Company, and he had a big machine called Jumbo One, which was the first generator that was actually built, and it provided enough power for 800 light bulbs, which doesn't seem like very much, but at the time it was 
you know, it was fairly novel and important. Um, so electricity has come a long way in the hundred and, I don't know, 30 years since Thomas Edison's time. Now power is generated all over the city and outside the city. There is a requirement, unlike other global cities, there's a requirement to generate power within the boundaries of New York City. And as a result, we have a bunch of power plants that you can see on this map that provide um, various types of, of energy and electricity to, to New York City. One of the um, uh, sort of, I won't say landmarks in a technical sense, although maybe a landmark, um, is, is Big Alice, which was built by the Alice Chalmers Company in 1965. It's in Queens when it was originally a Con Edison facility, like many of them when Con Edison was forced to divest its generating facilities. Um, during deregulation, it actually was turned over to Brooklyn Union Gas, it was turned over to National Grid, and now it is owned by TransCanada, and it's powered by natural gas. And again, that's just a function of what kind of um, energy source is, is cheapest and most effective. Um, and it's one of many, it just happens to be one that's more recognizable because you can see it from the east side. So one that you don't see, one source of power that you don't see are a series of power barges, which are actually floating power plants, which really are not there to produce electricity around the clock. They're there when there are peak periods, typically during the summer when it's hot, when you need additional energy to, to meet the load. They've been off the Brooklyn waterfront for a long time. They're not the greatest because they um, actually are run on diesel engines and they produce um, emissions, but they're there to, to meet the peak demand when needed. I'm sure everybody's heard about Indian Point. You can't not hear about Indian Point, but Indian Point, as, as most people know, is still going strong. Um, it produces, estimates vary, but it produces somewhere between 10 and 15% of the city's energy. If at some point in the future it does close, the city will have to scramble to find additional sources to produce that energy. Um, it's up in Buchanan, New York, and it produces a fair amount of energy, obviously, for Westchester Putnam County, but for New York City as well. So one of the cool things I found out in researching this um, was that New York State's grid is run by somebody called the, or an entity called the Independent System Operator. The thing about electricity is it has to be used when it's produced. So somebody's got to be in the business of actually matching the supply and the demand. Otherwise, you can't actually make the system work and terrible things happen. Um, and the way they do this is the, the independent system operator works for the state grid and it holds an auction a day ahead of each demand day. It forecasts the load, it goes out for prices from all the suppliers, all the generators. They price what their offer is and the lowest price essentially sets the um, the price for everybody. And so this independent system operator goes ahead and purchase that, purchases that supply for the next day. But then it, it's a constant process of matching that supply and demand. So every six seconds, everything has to be adjusted to make sure that there's enough power, but not too much power, because you don't want to short the whole system and blow everything out. Um, OK, so next is subways. Um, so not that many people, other than real, um, you know, train geeks are aware that the first subway in New York was not the subway that was opened in 1904, the IRT, but it was a pneumatic subway, which was developed in lower Manhattan. And there's a great story. I find it hard to believe, but apparently this guy developed the tunnels for this um, series of um, stations underground without anybody really knowing about it. He asked for permission to actually convey packages underground, and this was down on Broadway around Beach Street. I forget the exact streets. It was between Warren and Beach Street downtown, and he was able to go down there, dig this tunnel, and pretend that he was going to move packages between one place and another place. And again, this pneumatic technology was sort of very much in vogue. This was earlier than the pneumatic tubes. This was the 18, early 1870s. So he built these amazing stations and these cars. And between 1870 and 1873, about 400,000 people actually rode the thing. Nobody was supposed to ride it. They didn't have a license for 
people, they were supposed to be carrying packages. So I'm sure it wasn't safe. I'm sure there wasn't proper exhaust or, you know, egress or anything else. Um, and it was only some economic downturn in 1873 that stopped the whole operation because people stopped being willing to pay to go on his cool pneumatic subway, the remnants of which I am told are sort of still there, but I don't know that for a fact. Okay, so modern subways look a little bit different. Here's a little sort of um, a uh, series of visual images of how subway cars have progressed over time. Obviously, if you go to the New York City Transit Museum in Brooklyn, you can see all these cars and walk in all these cars. Um, and they really have improved over time within the parameters of the tunnels that they run in. So the new subway car, which 10 years ago was really new and novel, now it's pretty much everywhere except some of the old C trains and maybe some of the trains in the outer boroughs. Um, was a very cool thing when it first came out. Um, you wouldn't really know it as a passenger, especially if you travel at rush hour, but there was a bunch of features that were special. The doors were wider than the doors on the older cars. Um, the handrail was actually um, put at a certain height so that tall people would get it, but that short people could use the, short people like me could use the poles that come down um, to the ground. And then they have, of course, the, the little um, LED directional um, location things, which I've found basically work and um, do help tell you, at least if you're going in the right direction. And then next time you're on one of these trains, take a look and you'll see that unlike the old trains, there's no um, support under the seats and that's to make them easier to clean. Um, so it just makes the whole operation faster. So, these were the old, some of the old subway cars. These were the Redbirds. Um, and again, it's not looking so great right here because this is a retired one. Um, but the, the transit authority has to do something with the old subway cars. So what it does is it takes them into a shop and it basically strips them of a bunch of parts and it takes out all the asbestos and whatever other bad stuff is in them. Um, and this is, this is sort of one of the fun facts about what happens with New York City infrastructure. Actually, usually has an afterlife. So the afterlife for these old Redbirds is pretty amazing. They get taken on a barge through the harbor, down along the coast, and then they get dumped into the Atlantic Ocean, off, off Virginia, off North Carolina, off Georgia, and they actually make fabulous reefs for fishing, which like, who thought of that first? Like, I don't even know who thought of that. But I have seen it, I've been out on a boat in the harbor and looked and seen a barge carrying a bunch of railway cars going through the harbor, and it's like, wait a minute, they're trains, they shouldn't be on the water, what are they doing on the barge? And actually they're going to their graves, which is extraordinary. Okay, so the streets. Um, the streets of New York are, are very complicated. I teach real estate at Columbia, so I have to explain to people about the grid, where did it come from, the commissioner's plan. Um, was it a good thing, was it a bad thing? Still not sure what I think, but all I know is we have a lot of streets. Here's an image of the commissioner's plan, which many of you will be familiar with. And again, this was a very far-reaching vision of how New York should evolve at a time when New York was tiny. New York was downtown, there was very little of it, but the idea that real estate would, um, demand would push development north was very much in vogue, and so they did a plan for the, almost the entirety of Manhattan Island up to about 155th Street. And over time, that plan was realized. Those streets were open pretty much along the lines of the original commissioner's grid. So you can see that this was quite an ambitious attempt to cover up all the natural topography of Manhattan, all the mountains, all the little valleys, all the water features of which there were many, and it was indeed, you know, developed exactly like this plan. There's a great book out that a friend of mine, Gerard Coppell, just wrote, which is about the grid itself and how it happened, and it turned out, you should read this book, I think it's called City on a Grid, that it was um, largely accidental that they picked this plan, and then everybody took it very seriously and the whole city evolved around it. So it's quite an extraordinary story. Um, we were a rectilinear city because that's what the commissioner's plan said was the most efficient way to develop the city and some say to develop real estate, which became a very big part of the city's um, industrial uh, industrial wealth. Okay, so crossing the street, this, again, a lot of these things are random, but I came across them and wanted to know. I wanted to know about these push buttons because I've spent lots of time pushing those buttons and having nothing happen. 
I couldn't understand because they're kind of supposed to work. Well, actually, most of them don't work. And the reason that they're not taken away is there's somewhere around $400, $600, I can't remember what the number was. It actually costs money to take them away. And if you just leave them there, it doesn't cost anything. So there are some of them that work. You know, 10 years ago, it was, I don't know, 40% of them that work. And then there's a whole lot that don't work. So, I mean, if somebody cares, we could start a charity to take them all away. But instead, it's like, you know, just it keeps you guessing, right? You never know if you're going to, like, have the power or not. Um, so how are the streets managed? We all know that the streets are managed. We know that some streets are synchronized. The lights are synchronized. There is, you know... Um, or I should say there were, I'm sure there's different numbers now. At the time I wrote this, there was about 15 Gigundo computers that were all controlled, you know, I don't know, 700, 800 intersections each. So most of the lights at intersections, not all, are controlled remotely. There are cameras that are looking at what's happening. Many, not all of them, can be adjusted remotely. Some of them you actually have to go on site so that the timing can change depending on what kind of neighborhood it's in. So when you actually look at down here at what an intersection looks like, you can see that there are um, transponders in the street that can, you know, identify how much build up, how many cars are passing. You also have these don't walk signals and these walk signals, which are timed. So there is a normal gate that the system assumes. And I think it's like, I don't know, it's, um, I can't remember, it's three, um, three or, or four feet a second. I think it might be three feet a second. And that's the typical um, speed at which somebody crosses the street. But in areas where there are young children, where there are elderly, it takes a little bit longer. And so the system is timed to take account of that. And now it's something like, you know, they, they, they go up smaller amounts so the, the, the lights are adjusted accordingly. So it's a fairly sophisticated system. Okay. I am not going to tell you what each of these symbols is, but if you really want to know, you can look in the book. I was fascinated by the fact that I walked around. At that time, I was living on West End Avenue. There's always painting on the side. It's like in Mary Poppins, where there used to be those pastel, you know, like Bert would draw those paintings on the sidewalk. But these were, you know, very bright colors, and they were clearly messages that were sent to somebody. So I wanted to find out what they were. So somehow, I can't even remember where I got this information, was there's a whole little language of symbols around what's underneath. So you can see, if you can read it, there's some that's, you know, combined sewer, street metal lights, high pressure hydrant, wood utility pole, you know, tree to be removed. And then there's all the colors that sort of mark out the infrastructure underground. So this says sewers and drain lines, gas, oil, steam, electric. And so the combination of the colors and the symbols, you know, tell you a lot about what's underground. And this is effectively how a number of people who repair our infrastructure communicate with each other so that they're not cutting the wrong pipes when they go to fix something underground. So sidewalk vaults, I lived in London for a bunch of time, and sidewalk vaults were prominent there too. Sidewalk vaults, I just found them sort of super interesting as a structure. So the sidewalk vaults that exist in many places um, really were an attempt, obviously, to bring light from above the street to under the street, whether it was a coal hole, whether it was some other you know, form of um, room underneath. And basically, they were um, pieces of glass that were set into concrete with you know, metal supports running through them. But these were prisms that would reflect the light and you know, push the light out in a lot of different directions, essentially magnifying the light. And so that's really just all this is, which is just a cross-section of the sidewalk vaults that you still see and you still walk on. And I always wonder why they're safe. Well, they're safe because they're constructed like that. And this is just a kind of old image of um, how novel they were when they came out in terms of being able to bring diffused light down under the, you know, to subway platforms and to other things. So big business when it first came into vogue. And there you can see it, Bleecker Street, you can see the whole idea of being able to bring light underground was very, very novel once upon a time. Okay, a phone call. So here's what it used to look like before the blizzard of 1888, and then all of the telecom and 
um, other lines got put underground because everything got taken out during that storm, and that was the beginning of, of burying everything, at least in Manhattan. Obviously, there's telephone poles and stuff that's still um, outside in some, of the, in some of the outer boroughs. So all of that stuff goes underground. We see it. If you walk around a street that's being open, you can look in and you see all these, all these pipes. What's really interesting is that when we first put them underground, we put electricity and telecom, both of which were new in the late 19th century together. And that was not good. You know, the electricity and the telecom, and you couldn't communicate, you couldn't hear because there was electricity on the line, and so they sort of separated them out. Um, but what was really interesting is that the ability to run these conduits was given to a private company called the Empire City Subway Company. It was not a subway company. It basically constructed these these tunnels, and then it leased them out to anybody who wanted to run wires underneath. That entity still exists. Um, it exists as a subsidiary of Verizon. It controls a lot of the underground space, primarily in Manhattan and the Bronx, not all of it, and it leases out space underground to the Department of Transportation for street lights, to other phone companies for whatever they're doing, cable companies. Um, so it is still a private entity providing this very public service. Okay, so today, cell calls, this was meant to answer a very specific question. Um, at the time, people wondered why their cell service was disrupted when the power failed. When the traditional phones went out, why did my cell not work? And so I wanted to kind of answer that question. So I looked at the journey of a cell call, which is really goes one of two ways. Um, what's depicted here, and these are all in the book, is the journey of a cell call where the cell call is picked up by a transponder and is sent to a location by that cell provider who sends it to one of its own cell towers somewhere near the recipient. That works if you're on Verizon and you're calling somebody on Verizon. But if you're on Verizon and you're calling somebody on T-Mobile or something else, it doesn't work that way. What actually happens in that case is it gets funneled back to the regular landline system. So the call will be, the call will be launched. And then if it's going to a different provider, it actually goes through the regular landline system and then gets sent out to that other provider's um, sort of node that's closest to the end user. And that was the reason that a lot of cell calls just couldn't be, one of the reasons couldn't be handled when 9-11 and a variety of other things when people thought their cell phones would work and didn't. Okay, trash. I know you're going to have um, another lecture on sanitation and all that stuff. I did the solid waste management plan with a bunch of folks for Mayor Bloomberg. I really love garbage. Um, it's, it's, it's actually the one thing that's above ground that I find super interesting. So I like history a lot. And um, you may have heard of William Waring. He was like you know a, a, a god among engineers in the late 19th century. He had done a ton of other things. Um, before General Waring, before he came here and decided that New York City was dirty, we had tons of immigration, tons of industrialization, we had no organization of how to keep the streets clean, there were, I don't even know what, there were animals eating, I don't know what, there were dead horses, there was whatever. Finally, by the late 19th century, everybody realized this was a health hazard, we needed to clean up the city. He came in and he said, we need a professional culture of cleaning the streets. And he not only put together these sort of military looking groups of men, I guess they were mostly men, to clean the streets. He also created these like juvenile youth leagues of people who would learn to clean up and volunteer kids who would support it. And so he was really um, gung-ho. But he thought of it as an almost, um, it, well, he thought of it as a uniformed profession. And you can see he, they were called the white wings. They wore these white uniforms to collect garbage, these white uniforms. They had to have their hair trimmed a certain way. Their nails could only be so long. And he insisted that they had to be the epitome of cleanliness, which is fascinating. Um, and to this day, it's still a uniform service. Now, this is actually something that uh, um, is not in operation, but at the time was very interesting, which was the VZ paper mill in Staten Island. And this is, was how a lot of New York City's paper and paperboard was, was recycled. We throw out our newspapers, it goes. It is still recycled that way in some places, but a lot of our paper is now exported. Um, the idea was to create jobs in recycling um, you know, newspaper here in the city because we could consume so much of so much of it. 
But um, this is very, very relevant to today because after Fresh Kills, which was the, the city's last remaining and largest landfill, was closed down very suddenly in 1999-2000, we had something like, I can't remember, it's about 25,000 tons of garbage every day that had to be collected and disposed of somewhere. Up until that point, it had gone through the marine transfer stations, the little ones you see on the rivers. They had been dumped, literally the trucks were just dumped by gravity into the hold of a, um, a garbage barge and it was taken out to fresh gills and dumped on the landfill there. Once those could no longer be used because you couldn't put if you remember the barge to nowhere where there was a bunch of trash floating around and it didn't know where to go, the landfill was closed. And so what the city decided to do was, you know, think about alternatives. It tried to think about burning the garbage. That didn't go very well because nobody wanted an incinerator in there in their backyard. Um, they didn't even want it at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And so what's happened since is um, Mayor Bloomberg embraced a plan to containerize um, not all, but most of the city's waste. Some still gets trucked to an incinerator at the Essex Resource Recovery Plant in New Jersey, about 10% of the city's residential waste, but much of it now is being containerized. So if you come down the, um, the FDR and you see that big building going up on the water at 91st Street, that's a containerization station. There's other ones that have been built in Brooklyn and Queens. Um, some of the private sector has already had the capability of containerizing trains. This is actually in um, the waste management train in the Bronx. And so the garbage trucks come in there, they dump the waste, they're packed into these containers, and then that garbage is moved out by rail. Um, so all of the city's garbage will be moved out eventually by rail or barge. Where does it go? It doesn't stay in New York State. Most of it goes either to Virginia or Pennsylvania to landfills in Virginia. Pennsylvania. So it's not that there's a better technology, it's just moving further away because we don't have any operating landfills. Historically, we had many in the city. Um, they've all been closed now, so all of the waste goes to landfills that are operating in other states. Okay, sewage. We're just getting dirtier and dirtier as the evening moves on. Um, so we're at sewage, which is another fascinating topic. So New York City's sewers, first sewers, were built of brick and they were built around about the time of the Civil War. And the idea was simply just to move sewage off the streets and into the waters around the city. So they were pretty monumental. A lot of them have withstood the test of time and are still functional today. But remember, at this time, the waste wasn't being treated. It was just being pushed out. You might have heard of the um, you know, CSO issue, the combined sewer system. These sewers were handling you know, stormwater through street drains, and they were also, at some point, handling um, waste from private homes and offices. So, to just to, to give you a sense of, of dates, if 1865 was the first sewer, the first sewer treatment plant came in about 1890s. It actually wasn't in Manhattan, it was in Brooklyn. But the idea of actually regularizing the city's waste flow and making sure that all of it moved through a sewage treatment plant didn't really catch on until the 1920s, 1930s. So the idea of a modern treatment plant began in the 1930s. It really, to get all of the city's waste moving through these sewage treatment plants was not accomplished till the 1970s. The last one that was put online, of course, is in some ways the most spectacular, or New Agey, is the North River Treatment Plant in Harlem because it has a state park on top of it. So by the time we got to the 70s, people were like, wait a minute, you're not putting a waste treatment plant in my neighborhood without giving me something back, and they got a state park on top of it. Um, but that took 20 years to make that one happen. So right now, this is essentially what the city's wastewater treatment looks like in terms of where the plants are. Um, I spend a bunch of time in Jamaica Bay. Part of the issue with the quality of water in Jamaica Bay is you have four treatment plants that dump into it. Um, but you can see here's the North River, which was the last, and then there's a bunch of other um, uh, sewage treatment plants. Newtown Creek is the one that has the great new architecture um, that people love, and you can see there's other ones as well in Staten Island. Um, so these are monumental structures that handle an enormous amount of sewage. If you um, are a river buff and look out at river traffic, you may have seen one of DEP's fleet of um, boats that move sewage, and you might wonder why are they moving sewage around. They're moving it around because, I don't know if we can go back, but not all of these plants have the capability of dewatering the sludge. So this, the sludge needs to be taken to dewatering plants, and then um, from there it can be 
um, moved to its end use, which sort of varies. Um, one of the things that I found fascinating, and I don't know how much of the city sewage actually is going through pelletization now, um, is um, this was a plant in the Bronx where a certain amount of the city's sewage was being taken in here. And essentially, without going into the technical details, which you can read about in the book, the sewage would come in and be heated up and mixed with pellets that had already been made out of sewage to very high temperatures and you know, circled around until a lot of the water came off it. Um, that water was put through a series of cleansing mechanisms to make sure that the ammonia was removed and other stuff and, and then exhausted. But um, this process of heating and drying the sludge, what's left after the sewage treatment plants have done their job of breaking down the bacteria, separating out the water, and what's left as solids was brought here and was made into pellets. And these pellets were loaded on trains in the Bronx and they were taken to Florida and other places, but I love the part about them taking to Florida. They were a form of fertilizer. But what's super interesting, I used to work for the port, is that these trains would go to Florida with these pellets from New York City's sludge waste, and they would go to fertilize orange groves, and then Tropicana would send an orange train, literally a unit train full of oranges, from those places back to Port Newark and Elizabeth at their Tropicana plant. So it was like the whole circle of life, right? <laughs> between New York and Florida it was fascinating. Um, and that, that orange juice train still comes, so it's, it's pretty interesting stuff. Okay, we're almost done. We're, on, we're getting to clean water now. Um, you know, New York's water system, there's a lot been written about it, and it's absolutely fabulous and magnificent. You've probably heard about the third water tunnel, which we can actually see being built in parts of Manhattan, although you have to look closely at the fences to understand it. But here's what it looked like when it first opened. This was an enormous achievement in 1842 to bring clean water all the way from the Croton system. They dammed the Croton River and put in a series of aqueducts which brought the water down all the way across High Bridge from the, from the Bronx into Manhattan and down into its terminus, which was the Murray Hill Reservoir, which sits exactly where the New York Public Library now sits. It was this great Egyptian revival structure. You can see what New York looked like in 1842. Um, and it was only you know, a select few at that time who could tap into it um, because you didn't yet have the street infrastructure to send the water out to everybody. But it was a really big deal. Um, of course, the great thing about the water system is that it is almost wholly gravity fed. So all the water that's coming from the nearby Croton system, um, which was developed in the 1840s, the Catskill system, which came later in the early 1900s, and then ultimately the Delaware system, which is huge. You know, um, All of this flows by gravity through a series of pipes, aqueducts, it crosses the Hudson River, it comes in, and it flows down into, into tunnels one and two, um, and will eventually flow through the third water tunnel. So there's about 580 billion gallons of capacity that can be stored in this system, which is a huge amount. There's a lot that's lost every day, but because we're not, uh, we don't have a shortage of water, it's not so much of a problem. But there's, this area um, is 2,000 square miles of preserved area that really is New York City's watershed. And yes, they flooded communities to create it. There was all sorts of strange things that were done to protect you know, this amount of land essentially for New York City use. And it is still controlled very heavily in terms of um, what happens there so that the water stays pure enough to not require filtration or not require much filtration. So when it comes into the city, it comes in at high pressure. You can see here a schematic of the high pressure mains. Obviously, it has to get stepped down so that you know houses don't blow up. Um, you can see a series of secondary pipes, the distribution mains that run from the trunk lines and then run to individual houses. They also obviously support the fire hydrants, which require a certain amount of pressure as well. So it's a, it's a truly unique system that was state-of-the-art at the time and is still very, very functional. Um, people talk about New York City's water and they love the taste and they think it's so great. Um, it is kind of good, but it's not 
pure in the sense that there's a lot of stuff that's added to it, and there's stuff that is added to it primarily for health reasons. Um, chlorine is added to it in certain places because we need to kill the bacteria. Fluoride's added to it because we've decided it's good for people's teeth to have fluoride in the water. You get copper sulfate and caustic soda is added to reduce the acidity so that it doesn't erode the pipes. And you know this all happens in a series of locations which are located here on the map. So it is a very carefully managed system, and it's not just that the water falls as rain and comes through here and comes to your tap. That's not what happens. OK, you get the idea. OK, so another one of my faves, my above ground faves, is water tanks, which are a distinctly New York phenomenon. There are still a lot of them around. There's something like 15,000 of them. They're probably. Um, were, I think there were only ever a couple companies who serviced them, and those companies are still in business today. Why are water tanks important? Water tanks are important because the wonderful system that I just showed you has sufficient um, power to push the water up to about the sixth floor. So you'll see during that period, there's a whole series of you know, five and six floor high buildings, and you were not allowed to go any higher because you couldn't guarantee that you could put out a fire, and fire was a huge problem in the 19th century in New York, in the 18th and the 19th century in New York. So the idea of these, these water tanks was once you had electricity to be able to pump up water, the idea of putting them on top of buildings was really primarily for safety and security so that if there was a fire, you could actually allow the water to flow down. If there was no electricity, the water was up there and you could allow the water to flow down. So you can see once you got above six floors, you had this kind of a construct. So water tanks are amazing. They're made of wood planks. They are bound together like a barrel. There is no adhesive necessary because the wood expands to protect them, and they don't. the water doesn't freeze in them, which is amazing. Now, you have to protect these pipes because the pipes will freeze that come out of it, but the actual water in the water tank itself, because wood is such a good insulator, doesn't freeze. OK. Um, you may or may not have seen this, but I guarantee you going forward, you will notice these water sampling stations, which are on the streets of New York. Um, and they're these tiny little silver poles that, believe it or not, inside there is a little faucet, a little tap. And these are all the locations where, I just picked Manhattan because it was too hard to do the entirety of the city. Um, this is where the water is sampled by DEP to make sure that the water coming out is of the quality that's appropriate to drink. When you get into the situation of a water scare, it's usually because somebody has found something or tested something. Um, and these water sampling you know, locations are everywhere. OK, um, I don't know if there's wine sitting over there. It could be beer. It could be imported beer, imported wine. Either way, one of the things that people don't really see anymore, they used to see it all the time, is the port. The port is a very important part of our economic infrastructure. It used to be at the end of every street on the east and west side. It's now primarily in Newark and Elizabeth. There's a little bit in Brooklyn, a little bit in Staten Island. So some of the hidden um, heroes of, of New York City's infrastructure are the New York City pilots, who actually are the ones who bring these great hulking ships in over the bar at Sandy Hook. There is a sandbar that essentially runs near the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, and on the way in, um, really from um, Sandy Hook, and you need a certain amount of knowledge about the waters of New York to be able to safely take ships in over it, so that if you're a, you know, a pilot of a big ocean liner or a big cargo carrier, you are not captaining your ship into New York Harbor. You are leaving, um, relieved of duty, and a Sandy Hook pilot will come out to a very big ship in these tiny little boats, and then climb up this ladder, take over control, and steer um, that boat, that vessel, into port. In fact, there's harbor pilots and there's docking to pilots. There's two different varieties. The harbor pilots will bring you in, and then the docking pilots will take you into Newark Bay and dock the ship at Newark or Elizabeth. At least that's where most of them go. So the harbor depths over time, you can see in the top right the different ships that have come over time to New York. You will notice that they have gotten bigger and bigger. They're no longer liners, but they are cargo ships. And you can see how we've had to dredge the harbor to accommodate the different depths. So in 1850, the ships really weren't drawing much more than 10 feet of water. Um, by the 19, 1900s, they were drawing 20 or 30 feet. And then you can see as we move through into the First World War, Second World War, and up to now, we're now 
drawing 35 and 40 feet of water until today's container ships, and actually this has of course gotten worse over time, these look like these need 40 feet of water. We have just dredged blasted rock in this harbor to take it down to 50 and 55 feet deep. I would, I would ask if anybody knows the natural depth of the Hudson River, I'll just tell you it's 17 feet. Okay, so you can imagine if this dredging doesn't happen, and it happens almost every year, these ships are not coming in. So we not only dredged the sand and silt, we then blasted the rock in the Kilvan Cull, which is the channel that comes between Bayonne and Staten Island, um, because we are a, a natural harbor, but we're a natural harbor for kind of little ships. We're not a natural harbor for, for these guys. So that's where dredging comes. It's an enormous undertaking, um, and most of the navigable channel that comes into Newark and Elizabeth is now down to 50 55 feet, which is extraordinary. So I love containers. I did a documentary for PBS on the guy who invented the container once, so I just had to put this in the book. This is what a container terminal looks like. This is actually called the New York Container Terminal. It's on Staten Island. Very few people know about it because it's on the north shore of Staten Island, and unless you take a vessel through the Kill Van Cull channel, you don't see it. Um, there are, are many of these, but you know the, the cool thing here is the container itself, which you see, you probably don't realize, this was invented by a trucker who just had the idea, why should you have to load stuff on and load stuff on ships? Why not put it in a box in the factory, take it to the ship, put it on the ship? He devised a very cool way of attaching them one to another through these sort of hinges, which hold them together when they're on the water and the ship's turning. Um, and um, interestingly enough, didn't patent it in the sense that nobody else could use it. He devised this, it worked. He gave the technology to everybody in the world so that the world could essentially adopt the container all at once. There'd be no point in having one technology over here and another technology you know, in Europe where a, a container was going. And his company, Sealand, really started the whole explosion. And these containers are so important because what we know is the global economy could never have happened without them. The price of moving goods dropped to about a 20th of what it was for things that used to be handled by manual labor on and off a ship once they could just put it in the container and move the entire container into a ship. So all of the stuff we import, you know, shoes from Brazil or, you know, beer from Holland, other sorts of stuff, the cost of all these things dropped dramatically because of it. Okay, so last but not least is food. This is sort of a New York City thing. Um, so food's always been a part of our infrastructure, sometimes visible, sometimes less visible. Used to be very visible when everybody went to the market and did all their shopping at the market. Of course, those days are sort of long gone. Um, Hunts Point Market is still around, and for those of you who haven't seen it, I'd encourage you at some point to, to um, go early one day and see what goes on there. The Fulton Fish Market, which used to be located down in the, the South Street Seaport, is now up in Hunts Point, so is the terminal market, the produce market, the meat market, there's an awful lot going on there. And so this is still sort of the, the heart of, um, uh, you know, uh, commerce, uh, food commerce for New York City. There are other markets, they change over time. The Bronx Terminal Market, which is located here, is no more, that is now a shopping center. Um, there are other markets like Gansport Meat Market, which is a shadow of what it used to be. Um, and that's essentially, um, we're, we're sort of seeing markets come back in different forms now. So I'm gonna end with the journey of a carrot, which is how freight moves, which is one of my favorite things. I did work for the port for like seven years, so freight and how it moves is, um, is one of the things I love. So here's the carrots that are getting loaded into 50 pound or whatever they are bags in um, somewhere near Fresno, actually in Bakersfield. And they're moved to Fresno um, where they're put in a refrigerated car that's gonna take them on this eight day journey all the way to Hunts Point Market. So just following it, what happens is that car, actually I think it probably moves forward here. That car moves um, to somewhere, first it moves to Northern California where it's gets consolidated onto a train. That train is about 85 cars long and it's got a bunch of engines. It can't be longer than 85 because you've got to get it up over the Rockies. So there's 85 cars of refrigerated, I don't know what, that get sent over the Rockies and they go to Nebraska. They go to um, a big rail yard in North Platte, Nebraska, where that long 
unit train um, of refrigerated cars gets broken up. Some of it's going to head south to Florida, and some of it is going to head east towards New York. So it continues, and it goes through a variety of places. And forget about where these dots are located, because they're actually in the wrong place. It wants to go to Chicago. And in Chicago, it actually, because we divided the system into two essentially to freight rail systems, the west and the east. It can't continue on its journey. It has to use a short line railroad to take it from what was the Union Pacific terminus to where um, CSX, the railroad serving the east, is going to. The it doesn't get out of the train. The train gets moved on, but the crew changes, and you know, the Union Pacific freight guys leave, and the CXX freight guys take the train from Chicago, and it moves from Chicago to a place called Selkirk, New York, which is near Albany. And in Selkirk, New York, the train gets reconfigured again, and some of it is going to head to Boston or wherever it's going northeast, and some of it is going to head down the Hudson Line to the... Um, Hunts Point Market, but it can only go in the, down the Hudson Line at night because there's a few things like Amtrak and Metro North trains that use it. So it's got a very small window between sort of midnight and 5.30 a.m. to make its way down to the Hunts Point Market. It has to be clear of Croton by, I think, 5.30 in the morning so that the commuter trains can start running down. So that's pretty much, and then it gets to the Hunts Point Market, it gets unloaded, and those carrots go to where they're going. So it's a good eight days. And of course, carrots are pretty hardy, so they've been refrigerated and they can make it. So I think I'll just kind of end on that note, um, which hopefully is <laughs> sort of a fun note to end on. You got a carrot, you got a rabbit, and that's kind of it. So I hope you enjoyed that. So I don't know if anybody has any questions. I know these are a series of random things. They don't really explain anything. They're more fun facts. Oh, a couple questions. I think there's a mic that's going around. So many questions, but I'll ask this one. Uh, it's a two-part question. What is the greatest infrastructure challenge that you're worried about in New York's future? And what are the infrastructure challenges that you hear people worried about that you think they shouldn't bother worrying about? It's all, it, it, you know, the city has that one under control. Okay, well, the greatest challenge isn't, isn't necessarily a physical one. The greatest challenge is obviously funding and finding the money to upgrade parts of the infrastructure that need to be upgraded. If you're really asking what system do I think is the most creaky, um, I think that, you know, honestly, I think there are parts of our transportation system that are very creaky. I, I, I genuinely think that the situation at Penn Station is a serious problem, and that as soon as something bad happens there, then all of a sudden we'll all focus on it, but it's something that genuinely wants to be addressed. There is a real capacity problem that needs to be addressed there. In terms of things that I don't think we need to worry about, um, what's happening with the third water tunnel and the water system is you know, it's been long in coming, but it's a very complicated project. And here's where funding comes into play because the water system is funded essentially off budget through water rates. So we can continue to invest in that year after year. That project has not stopped. Forget about whatever you read in the paper about a scare about the city play. There's it's been funded consistently. That project has not stopped and will not stop. And I think we can do that because we've set it up as a separate funding mechanism. Where we get into other stuff and other problems is where you have somebody like the MTA um, that doesn't have consistent funding for its programs. And so you get into challenges, the situation at Metro North, situation at Penn Station, which is really owned by Amtrak, which has its own funding problem. So those would be areas that I think could use attention and one that doesn't need attention. Okay, thank you. Um, aside from all political all problems around funding, uh, what technology do you see that you think, funding aside, could offer the greatest improvements in quality of life for New York City? 
Well, you know, there's a whole lot of smart technologies that are out there, and I'm not an expert on them, but you can already see how something like GPS is affecting the way people drive and how we use our streets. It's essentially making more capacity by telling people where to go to avoid traffic jams. There's all kinds of smart technologies that have to go that, that, that actually can be used by the utilities in terms of how you use piping, how you send power, how you send signals about what's needed. And I think most of the utilities, who obviously are a big part of the infrastructure world, are using theirs. There's all kinds of remote sensing technology that are used to detect cracks in you know, things that would have taken a long time to understand. So it's all of that smart communication devices that can be used in a variety of different places and is really being embraced. The problem with our infrastructure is because it is old, it's not like you're creating something from scratch and can embrace those technologies um, or embed those technologies in the infrastructure to start. It's a matter of how do you then add a smart layer on some very old bricks and mortar infrastructure. But that's, I think, for, for every infrastructure provider is where, is where the future is. Hi, how would you rate um, New Can York. you speak up? Because I can't quite hear you. How would you rate New York's infrastructure compared to other great cities in the, in the world? Infrastructure? Um, well, how would I rate it? I would, well, I don't think you can compare New York's infrastructure to the infrastructure in a new place, a newer city, but for a city of its age, I think it's actually done incredibly well. I mean, we, we so take it for granted, we so take it for granted that our subway trains are gonna come every two minutes, that when we actually have a problem and it stops, it's a surprise. I mean, we take for granted that the lights stay on all the time. The reliability of Con Ed is something like 99.98, which is sort of ridiculous. When you go to other cities and the lights go down or there's brownouts or something else. So I think we take for granted a very high standard of infrastructure generally. There are parts of what goes on that I think are totally chaotic that I would define as civic infrastructure that are not well looked after, including our streets, including some of the crowding and congestion that could easily be managed in part by technology and in part by just um, better management by public agencies that I think doesn't, doesn't compare to the great global cities of the world. If you look at what's been done in places like London, Dublin, Paris, Copenhagen, in terms of the public realm, and how that, if you, you know, you're willing to think about that as civic infrastructure is managed, we don't score very, very high at all. But in terms of our hard infrastructure, the stuff we've been talking tonight, is pretty damn good, my opinion. Speaking of electricity, should uh, Indian Point go down? Of course, there's been some off and on discussion about that, I think, for a while. What are the realistic things that could possibly replace that amount of electricity to the city? Well, I mean, there are replacements for that amount of electricity. It's a question of what it's going to cost everybody. So, you know, there's coal-fired plants that aren't being used because it's not economic because natural gas is much cheaper. And they also pollute the environment. So it's not that we wouldn't be able to procure that energy. It's the cost and the environmental implications of that. Um, and, and a lot of it isn't so much that we can't get it, it's that we need to put in the transmission to get it. For instance, we could bring more power from the north. A lot of the power that um, is produced in the north in New York State is hydropower, and we could bring more down, but the siting of transmission lines is so difficult that we bring a lot across the river from New Jersey. It's just hard to do. If we had to do it, we could do it, but the cost um, you know, and the brain damage of trying to provide for that would, would be significant. And it may happen, but you know, it's sort of like necessity is the mother of invention. We're not gonna do anything until we get there because the cost is ginormous and would hit everybody's utility bills. Just what? I'm wondering, I'm wondering what you think of the very, very tall buildings that seem to be uh, happening in Manhattan. I, I think I was reading recently in the Times that there are more planned. But just a, your reaction. So you're asking me in my um, skyscraper book head what yes. I think of the very tall buildings. So that's like off subject, but um, I can tell you personally what I think. Um, there's 
uh, parts of that phenomenon that I totally have no problem with. The ability for somebody to put up something and change the skyline, I couldn't care less about the skyline. Skyline of New York is always changing. It's always been changing. And if you study real estate history and you learn about where skyscrapers came from, it was a race between New York and Chicago. It was a race with you know, midtown and downtown. And there will always be people who, for one reason or another, want to put up tall buildings. And, and it, you know, think about the history of cathedrals and palazzos. People always built tall because it seemed great. Um, what I don't love so much about what's happening is what's happening with these tall, expensive, you know, skinny residential buildings is a lot of them are just, you know, shelters for people to put a lot of foreign money into because it's a good investment. Now, I don't have a problem with them investing there. What I have a problem with is it does tend to, in some places, affect the neighborhood because you either have a lot of transients or you have empty buildings that really aren't adding to the life of the surrounding space. It's also obvious obviously affecting the real estate market as a whole. But I think what we're about to see now is that there's been a little bit of an oversupply of some of these buildings. And at some point, you know, it will stop. The issue is there's really only two places where this is happening, London and New York, and the same exact thing is happening in London. Um, and, you know, it's a secure investment. Real estate in, in Manhattan, for whatever reason, is a secure investment. So you can't blame those people for putting the money there. We have no way to regulate most of them. These are not, you know, special dispensation that are being given to folks. It's the zoning that the city has put in place. And for better or worse, we're a city that said, it's a private market, real estate is a private undertaking, and as long as you live by the rules, you can do whatever you want. Whether they're going to make money or not, I don't know. That's my take on it. Um, building on what you were just talking about, um, do we have the infrastructure to support all of these additional ginormous buildings, given the age of our water system, et cetera? Well, I mean, to, to be fair, these, these buildings don't go up without some recognition of the support that's going to be needed. So they all need to be vetted and to make sure that the systems in the surrounding area can support them. And where there is an issue with insufficient power or insufficient supply, those developers, it's incumbent upon them to work with the utility to figure out how that can be upgraded, and they have to pay for it. So there's a, you know, there's a mechanism to balance that. Um, you know, the question is really, and if you remember when the, um, the big Riverside South development over on the west side, the, west, the former west side rail yard, uh, the former rail yards was developed, there was an issue about what would that do to the 72nd Street subway station. You'd have so many new people coming there and the developer had to build that additional exit north of whatever it is, 72nd Street because it had to accommodate more people. So there's a mechanism for checking, checking, you know, to make sure that our infrastructure can support this development. And more or less it works. I won't say it's a perfect, it, it's perfect, but more or less it works. I think there's I'm here with um, one of your younger fans. In the breadth of your experience, a lot of it was probably quite familiar to you. What was the most unusual thing um, that you discovered um, when you were making this book? The most unusual thing? Well, I have to say, I really had no idea that we dumped those subway cars into the bottom of the ocean and that they had an afterlife. So I was totally taken by it. I couldn't quite believe it until until somebody took me out and I actually saw them going on their journey. So I just particularly liked that. I'm not sure why I liked it, but I just thought it was so ironic that these things that are run on these little tracks the whole time end up in these big open ocean with all these living you know, fish around them. So I kind of like that. I probably knew about 20% of this before I started because obviously I'd sort of dabbled in this world, but most of what's here I really didn't know about. And you could take any one of these subjects and go a lot, lot deeper. And I mean, that's in part why I ended up doing the transportation book after, because I was so interested in some of this stuff and hadn't had a chance to explore it all here. Um, is there any danger of these states, I guess it's Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Delaware, uh, uh, is there any danger of them getting fed up 
pun, no pun intended, with taking our, our waste garbage? Mm -hmm. um, or, or is there a worry about running out of places that will take it? Yeah, I mean, it definitely happens. I didn't show the slide, but there's, <laughs> it's pretty funny. There's something that was called, this is on the sludge side, the poo poo choo choo which was sludge for a number of years was taken to Texas. It was taken to a county in Texas that used to take the sludge, the remnants from the sewage treatment plants and use it as fertilizer on big tracts of land. And then the state stopped it, stopped doing it. So all of a sudden, you know, DEP had to figure out where it's gonna take this waste. And so it is possible um, that a state like Pennsylvania or a state like Virginia or the counties where those landfills are permitted could stop taking New York City waste. And obviously that will raise the cost to everybody and they'll have to find other solutions. But, you know, the, the strange thing about garbage is there's always somebody who wants it at a price. So it's just not within the city. Uh, improving infrastructure for New York City. Um, is it possible to say that the biggest roadblocks are federal and national or state or regional or city? In terms of improving infrastructure? Well, you, you know, this, see the, yeah. the biggest roadblocks. They're see. certainly not city because the city doesn't control a lot of the infrastructure you've seen tonight. The city controls garbage, city controls water, but the city doesn't control energy. That's really regulated by the Public Service Commission at state level and by the feds. It doesn't control the MTA, for instance. That's a state entity as well. So, you know, federalism, there's a lot of good things about federalism. There's a lot of bad things about federalism. But certainly infrastructure and infrastructure funding and who's responsible is one of the um, more complex topics when you think about, you know, is it good to have a level of state government in between a national government and a local government? And in a lot of countries where there is no level of state government, I don't want to sound like a political scientist, which is actually what I'm trained as, um, things work because the central government can just make it happen. But we set up a very different system, so the states actually play a big role in infrastructure. Do you think there's a chance that regional government could become more persuasive and effective in dealing with uh, infrastructure issues? I'll, I'll give you a two-letter answer, no. Okay, I worked for the Port Authority for seven years and it was really a wonderful place to work and the idea of the Port Authority was fantastic when it was created in 1921. Ironically, it never did what it was set up to do, which was a freight tunnel, a rail freight tunnel between New York and New Jersey. It could never build that, but it built the George Washington Bridge and it built the Guthles Bridge and it took over Path and it did the World Trade Center, it did everything else. So I like the idea of regionalism in theory, but you know, in practice, it's been very, very difficult to, um, to support it because the world has become very politicized and we don't any longer like the idea of having anybody independent doing infrastructure. The idea is a good one, it just doesn't, it just doesn't work here right now. I have um, two questions, one about potholes and one about global warming. So in terms of potholes, you mentioned streets. I don't know what exactly, which aspects of streets. My perception is that the potholes are even worse now than they were. Is that just my subjective perception? Are there challenges? Is this just money could solve it? Are there other problems? That's the pothole question. Um, I, uh, my personal opinion is that I don't know that the potholes are any worse. Some winters they're worse, some winters they're better, but DOT runs around and tries to fill them. I think they do a pretty good job, but you know, water expands and contracts, and until we have really significant climate change, it's still gonna do that in the winter here. Climate change was my second. You, I thought of this when you talked about the dredging of the uh, Hudson River, deepening the channel with rising I mean, how vulnerable is New York and what steps could uh, the city take to, or, or state take to protect the city? Well, just sort of a, a complicated answer, but I think our infrastructure is vulnerable because obviously we're, you know, Manhattan's an island, we're a waterfront city, we're built around a harbor, and a lot of our infrastructure is near the edge. Part of the reason we were hit so badly by Sandy was because we basically flooded in all of the places that had originally been water. I mean, Manhattan Island was a whole lot skinnier originally, and it's no coincidence, I don't think, that the flooding came right up to the lines of the original 
island. So we built out, we were greedy, we took that land, and now, you know, nature's giving us a pounding because of it. But in, in terms of the question about infrastructure, you can see with a lot of our infrastructure underground, because the subways, the electricity, everything, we're very vulnerable. We have a lot of openings, and the utilities are running around scrambling to try to you know, protect against the next storm. But when you put stuff underground and you're surrounded by water, it's, you know, it's, it's just a huge issue for, for any city like that. And a lot of cities are waterfront cities because they were ports originally. Great. Right. Well, we're going to make that our last question, but I, I, not that I know we could, have, we could have asked you questions all night, Kate, because what a fabulous and terrific presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, to say that you are a mine of information would be an understatement. I, I really felt that there wouldn't be a question we could ask that you would not know the answer to. And that is quite something when you consider the infrastructure of New York City. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that, but, but, well. It, anyway, it was absolutely terrific. So really, thank you so much. It, it's been such a pleasure to have you to be part of our uh, Labour, Literature and Landmark Lecture Series. Um, so, as many of you know who have been here before on these evenings, we like to make uh, a presentation to our speaker. So, Kate, uh, this is Victoria Dengel, our Executive Director. And, and I just want to add to Karen's comments. I always am very grateful when uh, our lecturers give us more reasons to love our city. And yes, it was some of what we thought were the less favorable parts of our city, but I know you've made me personally grateful for all the work that goes on behind the scenes to make uh, New York City the great city that it is. So thank you so much. And Kate Asher, on behalf of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen, founded 1785, we express our gratitude to Kate Asher, partner, Burrow Hoppold Engineering, and author of The Works Anatomy of a City, for your participation in the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen Labor, Literature, and Landmark Lecture Series. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>